Let me, so while we wait for um, other people to join us, um, I'll just begin. Oh. Someone here. Um, so hello and welcome to the ninth episode of Digging In Season 2. Um, I'm Lindsay Randall, the host of the speaker series, and Digging In is a series of live presentations with archaeologists from around the country co-sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. Uh, join us every other Wednesday through June uh, at 1.30 for our presentations. Uh, for a schedule of dates, we really only have one left, which is June 2nd, um, but you can visit us at pvd.andover.edu or at the Massachusetts Archaeological Society's Facebook page. Season three will begin um, in August, I believe August 11th. Um, and if you enjoy our programming, consider expanding your impact by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We are able to bring you outstanding programming through support of viewers like you. And you too, like Dr. Britt, can, this can be your first professional organization and look where you can go. Um, so today we are excited to welcome Dr. Kelly Britt all the way from New York City. Um, she is currently an assistant professor of urban archaeology at Brooklyn College, focusing on community-based historical and contemporary archaeology of urban spaces. She completed her PhD in anthropology for Columbia University in 2009, where her research concentrated on how identity and sense of place are seen materially through heritage discourse in urban settings. Before coming to Brooklyn College, she spent seven years as FEMA Region 2's regional archaeologist, where in addition to working on various projects, she worked on developing a more collaborative process to the con consultation, particularly with sovereign tribal nations. She's currently interested in exploring the intersection of activism and uh, preservation, heritage, and gentrification. Um, oh, sorry activism, missed a whole sentence there, uh, and materiality, and is working on several projects, including one looking at the intersection of historic preservation, heritage, and gentrification in Brooklyn, New York, an international collaborative COVID-19 Quidian artwork mapping project looking at trauma healing through materiality, and interdisciplinary mapping project with Brooklyn College colleague mapping stories of climate change on the Great South Bay in Long Island and collaborating with New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission and the New York City Archaeological Repository with several city archaeological collections, including the Van Cortland Manor House in the Bronx and the Rufus King Manor in Jamaica, Queens. Um, also remember at the conclusion of the talk, viewers are able to submit questions directly to me via the chat function, either at the side or at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then we will give our speaker time to answer as many as they can with the understanding they might not get to all of them. So welcome Dr. Britt and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It is so exciting to be here. Like I said, this was the first organization that I joined as an undergrad at UMass so many moons ago. So it's really nice to sort of be back here in sort of full circle. It's really wonderful. And thank you all for uh, coming out today on such a lovely day and spending it once again in, in many of our lives in front of the screen on Zoom. It's nice to see some friendly faces out there. I'm going to start uh, screen sharing and get going. All right. So can everyone see the screen? Is it a good? Are we good to go? Yes, but do the play from start. Oh, did it not? Okay. It did not do that. Okay. How's that? Uh, Still did not work? No, now it's not working. Okay, hold we on. We tested this, everyone. I know, okay, it's all right, it's all right. We'll try this again. All right. Um, how's that? No, I mean, we can see it. It just happens to not be the full on screen. It looks like a normal, like before you start presenting. Oh, you're kidding. Okay, hold on, let me see. Um, that's weird. I know, especially because this literally worked before when everyone was in the waiting room. Yeah, that's really strange. Um, okay. Wait a second. 
Hmm, let's try this one. Now? No? No. Okay. I'm gonna try it one last time. I mean, if not, we can I mean we can see stuff, so don't worry. Here, let me stop sharing so you guys don't have to yeah. see all the tech stuff. And let me just um close it because as everyone knows, it's sometimes if you just open and close things, things change, right? Yes. Let's try this again. Like it will only do it once. And since we did it once. Exactly. It to... Exactly. All right. So hold on a second. Let me reopen. And we will go from there. You know, after teaching for over a year online, you think I would have um, figured out all the, the tricks of the trade of this, but no, things continuously come up. All right, let's try this one more time. And let's do presentation. Um, it's gonna be. I know, hold on a second. I can't see the the top where it starts the presentation idea. Slideshow, play from start. Can you see the whole thing now? I mean, we see the screen, but it's also, we also see the next few slides. Okay, hold on a second. Um, then we're gonna just start it. Let's, yeah. let's, let's just do this. Um, all right, let me reopen it. And we'll do that. Apologies, everyone. And let's do this. Okay. Okay. Try the slideshow up at the top. Okay. Like that. And then bring your shared window to the front. Yeah. Try that. Does that work? No, but okay. No. Let's just go. I apologize. I don't know because all I see is a full screen. Yeah. So it's really strange. I'm not sure why that's happening, but it is what it is. So I first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for being here, like I said. And before I get too trigger happy, ah, oh, there we go. Um, I want to just start today off with a land acknowledgement. As we gather today from various places, many of us are doing so while seated, sitting on unceded territory stolen from the indigenous people, as I sit in Brooklyn on the unceded territory of the Canarsie and Nyack subgroups of the indigenous Lenape people. That ongoing theft along with the stolen blood and work of enslaved Africans and African descended individuals facilitates our presence. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future who have stewarded this land. We recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist and uphold their sacred culture. We know that this acknowledgement is neither sufficient nor complete, but is part of a process of learning to become more thoughtful and negotiate new and equitable ways forward. I thought this was appropriate considering the topic today is archeology span advocacy and social justice, preserving the past for the future. So as I said, thank you, uh, Lindsay, for having us here today. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this topic. It's a topic that's really close to my heart and is actually one that I've been talking about in various types of formats and papers, presentations. But um, if you do like this topic, there is actually an edited publication coming out shortly through Bergen Press with myself and, and others that um, are really focusing on advocacy and archaeology, particularly in urban settings. So um, stay tuned if, like I said, if you like it, there is more to come. So with that, how does archaeology, advocacy, and social justice interconnect? Well, most of us probably know from organizations like the Massachusetts Archaeology Society, um, that we, you know, these organizations and archaeologists have been longtime advocates for archaeology and the preserving of a resource, right? The actual material heritage that's located in communities. However, um, we also can think about the archaeology and advocacy in terms of the communities in which they live, 
right? And a lot of these organizations were started or um, sort of support a lot of the legislation that happened either on local, state, and national levels that help support the archeological resource. And now we're starting to see, particularly in the late 20th and the 21st century, more of a focus on the people that are connected with the resource. And that's really what I'm, I'm focusing on here today. This idea of the community that these um, sites, these heritage places, these important sacred places are located in. So, Just, you know, we're still on the first slide. You are. Oh, I mean, we can see the other two, but is there a way to <laughs> scroll it down? God, it's so weird. Okay, hold on. Um, can you get out of your full view? And then that might help. Okay, let's try. Okay. And then can so you, you see, yeah, so if you make that smaller, yep, perfect. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah. All right, so I was on this one with the laws, right? And most people know about these laws. I'm, I'm since I work in New York City, the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission's um, laws really uh, sort of govern a lot of what I do as well as NEPA, of course, and the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, but when we think about um, sort of this shift from the resource to communities, I also want to sort of define what I mean by communities. Um, and that that's really a complex and interconnected definition. So in some instances, communities can mean the, the direct descendant communities that the, the resource is located in. It could also mean, particularly in urban settings that I work in, the present day communities that reside in the same location. So they may not have necessarily a genealogical connection to the resource, but they are connected with them through space or through memories. And then you also have sort of a, a combination of, of the two or, or groups and communities that might be connected through a diaspora, which is really what I'm going to be talking about today, is uh, sites that are connected through the African diaspora. So you, there's usually these multiple um, communities at hand with multiple voices. And so what I'm, I'm thinking about today is this idea of how to include those different voices, um, in particular, um, for areas that need uh, attention due to injustices in the past, in the present, to, to change for the future. The other thing I would like to just sort of start off um, and sort of clarify for going forward is when I'm talking about archeology span today, I use a very broad brush stroke in terms of my definition of it. Because of these laws and their connection with historic preservation and heritage management, when I think of archeology, span um, once again, particularly in urban spaces, I'm not just referring to the excavation of the earth, but I'm also thinking of excavation of stories, right? So thinking about stories that um, archaeologists are really well known at doing, especially historic archaeologists, um, most of what we do is really this process of telling stories, multiple stories, different lenses of stories of how uh, the past was, was um was lived, how it can possibly help shape the present and change the future. And this really, I think, is um, well illustrated through the rise of community-based archaeology, which is what I practice or the type of method that I practice. Um, and sort of thinking about archaeology, not necessarily as this top-down um, expert uh, in invoking knowledge on, on non-experts, but rather a dialogue of all experts. The community is, an, is experts as well as the archeologists and, and the sharing of this expertise. So I really think of archeology span more as a conduit really that can bring attention to these injustices, once again, that have occurred in the past are still happening in the present in order to change the future. So I've really been focusing a lot of my attention these days on um, a term uh, coined by Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who is a noted urban geographer. 
She's a fellow CUNY professor, she's an activist, and she's a co-founder of many grassroots organizations that focus on social justice work. And she has this term called abolitionist geography. She primarily works in sort of the connected areas of racial capitalism, organized violence, criminalization, incarceration. Um, and she has this wonderful quote that I that really has got me thinking about it and how it can be used in terms of archaeology and 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 the use of archaeology. And she says, "quote People make abolition geographies from what they have. Changing awareness can radically revise understanding of what can be done with available materials." End quote. So basically, in essence, as I state here, people are producing change from what they have and going forward. And in I've been thinking more and more about this in terms of my own uh, work in archaeology, like thinking about archaeology and everything that we uncover, whether it's through documents in historic archaeology, the built environment, the actual material remains that lie beneath. The, the thought of taking those stories and bringing a changing awareness, right, with what we have, the information that we have, and moving forward is something that I'm really thinking about in terms of everything that I do. And I've started to think about this more in terms of abolitionist heritage and thinking about things um, from a very different point of view and thinking of archaeology more as a tool rather than an ends or, or means to an ends. This is a picture of Ruth Wilson Gilmore above. Um, and she really, she coins the, the idea of abolitionist geography once again as sort of a, a way to understand freedom in a provisional space, one that is built with people with their resources at hand, very similar to what her other quote is. And then this picture on the left is a map of the 1938 Homeowners Loan Corporation map of Brooklyn, which essentially is the redlining map of Brooklyn. So all the places in red were deemed um, not mortgage worthy. And all those areas in red were also deemed that way, mainly due to the demographics that lived in the area based on race. So primarily all these areas were areas of black, brown and marginal communities that um, once again, you start to see this in the landscape and shaping how these policies dictate what is being built what is being used and the stories that lie behind those. Uh, so today to sort of highlight well, how I think archeology span can sort of be used as a tool, I'm going to just show a, and share a couple of examples. Um, they're all from New York City. Three of them are from Brooklyn, one's from Manhattan, two you may know about, um, two you may not. And, um, just spend a little bit of time, because I know we are, are, are limited with time today, to just sort of highlight what can be done with this sort of advocacy or activist approach to archaeology and um, hopefully shed some, some light on these things. So first and foremost, um, these are sort of a map, and I apologize for the teeny map. Um, it's really hard to get all four of these, despite it being one city, it's pretty large. So uh, we have African Burial Ground in Lower Manhattan, 227 Duffield Street in Brooklyn. Uh, we also have Weeksville Heritage Center in Brooklyn and 87 McDonough Street, home of the United Order of Tents, also in Brooklyn. So I'm going to highlight a little bit of these today. So starting off is a site that many of you in the audience might be aware of, and that's the African Burial Ground site in Manhattan. Um, and it's, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'm sure many people are aware of it, but I really felt that I needed to pay homage to this because it really was this site that was excavated in the early 90s that significantly changed the way New York City archaeology and historical archaeology in general was done. There was more community involvement. It reshaped how bioarchaeology was done. It really changed sort of a way of thinking about the impact that archaeology can have, not just on exposing what the past was, but on the current community. Now, while this project and this site was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 92, uh, it was designated a, a National Historic Landmark in 93. It wasn't made a national monument until 2006. So it kind of shows you sort of the late, um, even though the 90s seems ages ago, <laughs> it still is relatively uh, soon in the whole host of um, archaeology and 
and sort of work that's been done in the US. And I think this site continues to bring um, some major uh, sort of lessons to be learned and thinking about the more recent um, horrific events with the move remains at UPenn and the endless work to pass the African American Burial Grounds Network Act to protect African American cemeteries. Um, it's a really important site to show what activism and advocacy can really do. And I just want to highlight today, and I'll put it in the chat once I'm done sort of navigating <laughs> my shared screen, is that um, there's a new article in Nature that was just, uh, I think, issued today by Justin Donovant, Delon Justinville, and Chip Colwell about the proposal of essentially uh, an AGPRA, uh, uh, African American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. So similar to sort of taking NAGPRA and using it for African American graves. Um, so I just wanted to pay homage to this. Uh, such important site. And this is another um, or two great maps. Uh, the first one, unknown author, but it's from the 1700s. And you see the, the level of um, how big the African burial ground was. And the one that probably a lot of people are familiar with is the um, Mashalak uh, map of the Negro burial ground. The area in white is the area that was excavated for 290 Broadway. And ironically, my FEMA post for most of the time I was at FEMA was in that building at 290 Broadway. So once again, things come full circle. I now wanna bring attention to another really important site and one that's close to my heart is the Weeksville Heritage Center in Brooklyn. This is a site that maybe some of you in the audience have heard about. It's a 19th century free black community that was started by James Weeks an African-American from Virginia who purchased the land in 1838 from another free African-American land investor. So you have to remember at this time, the only way that men of color could vote was if they owned and paid property taxes and the property needed to be worth at least $250. Um, so many people flocked, particularly um, Black investors flocked to Weeksville to be able to purchase land so that they could vote. In many, you know, so in, in many instances, the, the site itself is, is a form of activism. In, uh, or by uh, 1898, when Brooklyn became part of New York City, uh, the legacy of Weeksville was known locally, but it did start to sort of drift out of the larger public consciousness at this time. And it wasn't until the mid uh, 20th century when James Hurley, a historian and others, including Dr. Joan Maynard, created the Preservation of Weeksville and Bedford-Stuyvesant History, which is now known as Weeksville's Heritage Center. And it was created in the late 60s, early 70s. They did a true community-based archaeology project and and um, were able to save what is known as the Hunterfly Row houses, which you see located here at the bottom. These are all historic um, photos. Credits are over here. This is Joan Maynard with um, community members, community children. This is a historic picture of the houses. Um, they were able to save these houses from an urban renewal uh, program at the time um, called the Model Cities Program. And due to this, it was able to turn into a National Historic District, it became a landmark in the 1970s, and most importantly, it now serves as a multidisciplinary museum whose mission not only is to preserve and interpret history, but also to encourage Black history and education, the arts and civic engagement. Uh, Dr. Maynard was a executive director from 1974 to 1999. She served a long term there and she was a community organizer. She was an artist, a preservationist, and she really helped bring the archaeology into the classrooms to not only teach about the history, but also to use archaeology to help teach what we think of now as STEM and STEAM skills, right? So using archaeology as a tool for education. In 1999, sorry, in 2019, I can't believe I just dropped us back to 1999 again. Um, it was threatened to close due to budgetary constraints, but the community now sort of came to the aid of the site. In this instance, is that dialogue sort of that I was talking about, right? And it quickly raised funds that needed to survive. Additionally, representatives 
It was came to its aid and not only nominated, and it was accepted to the Cultural Institutions Group, which is, um, or a CIG. It's uh, essentially a, an urban group here in New York City of 33 organizations on city-owned property that receive regular funding. So the funding issue starts to become less of, um, well, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't give full support funding. It does make a, a yearly funding revenue part of the, the program. Um, Unbelievably, though, it made it the first historical black CIG in Brooklyn. I can't believe it took it that long to have that happen, but it did. Um, funding, as we all know, is a huge, huge hurdle for archaeological projects, for preservation projects, for any type of advocacy. So having some sort of a, a financial fund is really um, an important aspect. I was had the pleasure this semester um, at Brooklyn College to be able to work with my students and members of Weeksville, um, some who are actually on the call today, to talk about sort of this larger story we looked at sort of how you could tell stories through the landscape and the transformation of the landscape, particularly um, looking at racist public uh, health policies, uh, aspects of redlining, as we saw on the map before, and different ways that um, there was a historic cemetery that was associated with Weeksville that was um, that suffered from financial um, uh, uh, it, it basically ran out of money or the people that owned it ran out of money and they were all the people that were there were, were uh, uh, removed and reinterred in a different cemetery and of course that's where some major boulevards are now located so we started to look at how these landscapes has changed over time how has it affected the health policies of this community in the past present and given that we're in the middle of COVID and this area was, was so heavily impacted um, in the present as well. I'm now going to move on to 227 Duffield Street, which many of you, I know a few people in the audience um, do know about it, but not everyone does. And I need to first give a big thank you and shout out to my dear friend and neighbor who is, who is highlighted here in this wonderful picture, Ms. Willie Watkins. Um, whose um, tiredless, tiredless effort helped preserve this building. 227 Duffield Street is actually located in a street in Brooklyn that's now known as Abolitionist Row, primarily due to the amount of abolitionist activity that was done um, on this uh, street and in this area in the 19th century. So the the building was built around 1847, 1850. It was once home to Harriet and Thomas Truesdale. They were abolitionists who lived there from 1851 to 1863. Thomas was a founding uh, member of the Rhode Island Anti-Slavery Society. And um, so some of you may be um, familiar with that society considering you're, you're, you're actually probably closer to, to Rhode Island than we are here. Um, and they were known, um, the, the Truesdales were known friends to William Lloyd Garrison. It was the last of the surviving structures on this row that was left and threatened by demolition as part of recent renewal efforts for downtown Brooklyn. Uh, efforts to save this building have been going on for quite some time, particularly about um, by one former owner, Mama Joy Chattel, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. And she even had a museum in the building dedicated to sharing the story of the Underground Railroad in Brooklyn. Unfortunately, as we're seeing throughout Brooklyn and actually throughout all of New York City, there's, there's predatory development speculation um, that's rampant here. Um, and it's really wreaked havoc in a lot of preservation processes and um, caused a lot of harm uh, throughout the city. So while this street was actually uh, renamed Abolitionist Place and given this sort of uh, nod to uh, its heritage, the site itself went up for landmark status uh, through the city several times and was denied. And it really, um, I think, goes to show sort of the, the problematic nature in dealing with particular types of history. In this instance, Underground Railroad history, which as we all know, was secret. It was meant to be secret. The, 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 the point of it was to not tell, to not have um, materials, to not have evidence, right? So the aspects of um, 
proving quote unquote a, a historic past or some sort of integrity to a building is still problematic in a lot of these spaces. And it's something that um, I know many people are, are starting to really focus in on because it's causing a lot of um, really important heritage site not to be uh, noted and not to give the, the status that they deserve. So while the protests have been going on since 2007 or um, even before then, it really wasn't until last year in the height of the, the COVID epidemic here in New York City and at the height of the Black Lives Matter protest that it really started to ignite uh, more of a movement for 227 Duffield with Landmarks Commission. There was a hearing um, and it took several hours to hear everyone's testimonies. There were three archeologists that testified, including myself. And um, it, wasn't, it was in January, 2021, so just a few months ago that the decision was finally made to landmark this property and now the city actually owns it. Um, they're still talking about ways that they're going to be able to share and, and think about sharing this, this important history to the larger community. But the important thing is it's not going to be another high-rise luxury building that's going to sit empty um, in the middle of downtown Brooklyn, which many of those buildings um, currently are doing. But I have to say, I honestly don't know if it would have been landmarked if it wasn't for the, um, the protests and for the activist work that happened with the Black Lives Matter movement at the same time. I don't know, um, and this is my own personal opinion, um, if it would have been landmarked since it, it, it was not landmarked uh, several times before that. And lastly, I wanted to just share an extremely dear uh, site to me, and that is the United Order of Tents Eastern District 3 headquarters, which is located just a few blocks from my house at 87 McDonough Street in Brooklyn. And you're probably asking yourself, who are the United Order of Tents? So I know many of you probably have heard about the African burial ground. Some of you probably Weeksville, maybe a couple of you, 227 Duffield, but I, I know a couple people in the audience know of the United Order of Tents because they're my neighbors. But um, most of you probably don't. And it's a question I ask myself every time I walk by the house. My daughter's bus stop was at the corner, so I saw it on a regular basis. The tents, uh, they're, they're sort of, uh, has their known locally is a women's fraternal order that dates back to the mid 19th century. The founders were two former enslaved women, Annetta M. Lane and Harriet R. Taylor, and they were supported by two abolitionists, John Jolliffe and Joshua R. Giddings. And that's sort of, you can't really see it here, but their initials are over on the corner. Um, actually, the last initial is JU for union, because it's a union between them all. It's essentially a fraternal lodge or a benevolent society and was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Uh, the tents, as, as there is in their title, was used to help assist enslaved persons escaping north. And while formally organized after the Civil War, they were originally uh, started around 1847 and they were known as the Tents of Salvation. Uh, the organization's rooted in Christian charity work and provides food, um, places to bathe, nursing care, and importantly, proper Christian burials to those in need. So like 227 Duffield um, and any Underground Railroad history, there's an aspect of secrecy to the tents. Uh, so not much is formally known uh, about the organization, particularly Eastern District 3. 87 McDonough Street is, is basically their home to their headquarters. And uh, they have been here since uh, the 1940s. And this, uh, these two photos actually illustrate what the house probably would have looked like from the front facade and then from the carriage house that doesn't exist any longer around the time that the tents would have been there. The building, while it's been registered on um, the National Register of Historic Places since 1996, and is located in the, historic, in the listed Stuyvesant Heights uh, Historic District, as you can see here, the blue is the original historic district. The red is now the uh, additional historic district. And really hard to see, but it is probably right around here. 
The property the, looks like it's in disrepair and it's been abandoned. The tents actually uh, sold a portion of the back lot to a developer to be able to pay for the stabilization of their house. Um, and unfortunately, just like the predatory development um, speculators, the contractor did not serve the tents well and much of the house still needs to be restored. The house, the, the wall's been stabilized, but much more work is needed. The organization's continuing um, to work on their nonprofit status in a more formal way so that they can apply for historic preservation funds or grants. And while there's few remaining members left, we have started to um, expand that through um, more public engagement. And um, this aspect of secrecy though has been one that protected them. And it's been sort of the issue of, of trying to incorporate new members now because the secrecy protection now is not serving them. It's providing them sort of an insulation from the regular and uh, the larger community and harder to create new memberships. I've been working with other um, researchers and scholars to sort of be uh, friends of the tents to help with either historic preservation, writing grants, even membership drives, um, anything that could be done to sort of help preserve this sort of backbone of the community. While it's waiting for nonprofit status, um, I started to ask myself like, what can this, this site offer to the larger community, particularly in terms of historic preservation and urban planning. Um, and thinking about how historic preservation, archaeology, heritage, all those terms I talked about at the beginning, can actually be seen more as a tool for the community to help plan what they want in their community, not the right, not the other way around, not having the, 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 the city necessarily plan it for them. Um, particularly since this area is going through some hyper gentrification and um, it was subject to so many different types of displacement or confinement, confinement through redlining, um, confinement through the 1970s uh, fiscal crisis of New York City, and now through displacement of gentrification in the 21st century. I'm a community member and has have been since 2011, but I also realize that I'm part of this gentrification problem. And that's really why I wanna work with the community to better understand the gentrification process so that the community can have more of a dialogue and a more of a say and a more active role in how their community evolves. For all urban communities are evolve. We, we know that there's not much we can really do about that, but having a say in it is really an important part. So in, in December of this past year, 2020, a really bizarre post uh, happened on our community Facebook page that listed the house uh, for sale for $9.7 million. It turned out to be fake. It was a fake ad that was orchestrated by an online scavenger hunt. And while the, the ad was fake and it was taken down soon after, it generated so much community discussion about the importance of the house and the organization and the heritage to the community that in March 2020 for Women's History Month, the tents held a public event for the um, through the Brooklyn Public Library and over 650 people registered for it and almost 200 people showed up for it, which was pretty amazing on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. Um, the history really uh, sort of shined through and there's this ongoing struggle to sort of keep predators away. But it's really interesting that, that that talk even ignited more discussion. And just recently, a local church group took up that sort of narrative of uh, predatory um, uh, uh, speculators and made a play, a virtual play about the tents that just that just played this last weekend and compared, uh, even compared the developer to an enslaver. It was really powerful and it promised or promoted so much discussion about history, heritage, the importance of um, these spaces and the power of black women and their organizations like the United Order of Tents. So I'm really looking forward to work with them more and serve as an accomplice to um, righting the wrongs of the past. So sort of to close up shop for today and, and give you a, a, a little bit of 
thoughts on what I think about um, archaeology and the power of preservation is that I really think that historic preservation's true power really lies in the people that are connected to it. So while I, I love material culture, as probably every archaeologist does out there, I really love the stories that they tell. Um, and the buildings, not just the archaeology and the artifacts, but the buildings, the spaces, everything that, that is held in that, that place are so important. And thinking about how all of what we do can sort of work with communities to build something that is more of a, um, a, a space that is filled with justice and, and trying to, um, to provide a, a, a more inclusive narrative about the past. So with that, I really want to thank everyone, particularly Lindsay and the Massachusetts uh, Archaeology Society for having me today. A big shout out once again to Miss Willie Watkins for letting me use her picture. All those that worked uh, effortlessly at 227 Duffield Street, Weeksville Heritage Center, who has been a pleasure to work with, and all the sisters of the United Order of Tents for their perseverance and resilience. Um, I have an email here if anyone's interested in asking more specific questions and, and does not feel like doing that today in a public setting, uh, feel free to contact me. And Lindsay has it so she can always share it as well. Yes. Um, so yeah, so if you have any questions for Dr. Britt, you can put them in the chat now and I'll relay them. Um, but I, I would like to start in terms of a lot of um, younger archeologists are sort of up and coming, right? And I think a lot of them, the field is changing, wanting to work with communities. But given, like you mentioned, what's happened in Philly with the members, the remains of members of the African family, um, up here, Harvard Peabody's uh, Museum, mm -hmm. finding remains of African-Americans, mm -hmm. not just all the indigenous stuff, but what would you, sort of recommend or what would your advice be for like newer archeologists on how to sort of contend with the inherent problem, na problematic nature of archeology span so far um, in terms of like how to fix it as you're the one coming up um, and maybe working against older people who are entrenched like us. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's a really excellent question and um, one that I can, you know, as a as an instructor, as a faculty member, um, it's something that I think about on a regular basis. I think the first and foremost, um, at least for me personally, is to confront it. You need to confront the past. Archaeology, as we um, as we know, is is based in a, a colonial practice um, and trying to to confront that and um, not, not just put it to the side or, or compartmentalize it, but really start to think about how um, the knowledge that we know now, how it, was, how it was created, how it was formed, and thinking about ways that we can shift that going forward. Right. So in terms of like sort of in the classroom, per se, like thinking about new pedagogical ways of, of teaching archaeology from not just who we read, who we study, but also in terms of methods. Like I said, the African burial ground really shifted the way a lot of bioarchaeology was done, but they're still done in, in, in many places in, you know, as we just witnessed through, um, not just having the remains, but how they teach um, through, even if they're not, um, if they're like plastic replicas, how you teach about um, bioarchaeology still needs a, a, a really large shift. And I really think that the, the next generation can demand that. Um, and really, you know, start to question things more and, and really call things out if they are more aware of what, what this discipline was sort of uh, founded in, right? And change it um, and start to change it. But I don't think we can just um, ignore it for one, definitely not. Um, but also I, I don't think we can, we need to con constantly confront it. I don't think it's something that can, can be put in a box on a shelf and say, okay, I confronted it, done and move forward. I don't know if that really answers your question, but it's no, it kind does. of complicated, so yeah. 
It does. Um, another question is, uh, what got you interested in this uh, form of archaeology? Because chances are that was not what you went to school for. Um, no. So, good point. Um, for me, I just I think it it was my dissertation site that um, really kind of opened my eyes as to what archaeology can do. I worked at the Thaddeus Stevens and Lydia Hamilton Smith site in Lancaster, um, Pennsylvania, in Lancaster City, Pennsylvania, and it was the 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 site of a proposed convention center and hotel. And once again, the, the reason why archeology span was done was that it was gonna be demolished. And working with um, archeologist Jim Dell and Dr. Marianne Levine, um, we um, when with students, we sort of did a true salvage archeology span there and found um, material remains that we believed were connected with the Underground Railroad and really helped save the site. And what I really found was that not only was the site able to be saved or portions of the site, but what I found the most interesting was the symbol that the site had to the larger community. So for instance, um, Juneteenth used to be a regularly um, practiced holiday in the area. And many people in the African-American community there would celebrate at, on Stephen's uh, uh, grave since he was the one of the co-writers of the 13th and 14th Amendments. And it sort of fell out of practice in the mid 20th century and it resurrected uh, through the archaeology, we started to have much more uh, of a community-based uh, celebration of a lot of African American history. And now um, the the site is um, is it's while the the exterior has been restored, the interior is still going to be um, uh, restored. It kind of unfortunately hit that housing and uh, recession crisis right when we needed the the money for full restoration but there'll be more of a public um, uh, space there for exhibiting this type of of history of the area and i think that was really what showed me the power of of community and the power of um collaboration um and what it can really do to sort of shift not just what we know of the past, but what we can actually do in the present. Awesome. Um, another question is, is there one object or objects, or again, using your broad definition of what archaeology is, that you have seen like a community really sort of gravitate towards or sort of was like mind blowing for them to see or just like really had a connection with? Um, mm. That's a really good question. Um, I think it really depends on the site and what type of information. Sometimes just the site itself and the, the presence of being there. Having taken um, until COVID my, my students to the African burial ground every semester in whatever class that I'm teaching. And believe it or not, majority of them, A, did not know that slavery existed in the North, despite living in New York City their whole lives. B, never knew about the African burial ground, despite living in New York City their whole lives. The power of place, uh, particularly at that site, is, is really, um, it's hard to put in words. And to see students' reactions, to be able to witness that and witness that, that place and that power, I think is, um, it's just really, uh, it's, it's awe-inspiring as to the, to what, not just the material and the built environment can do. And, you know, as, as most people in, in this Zoom know that the African burial ground artifacts were reinterred with the human remains. So there's only pictures there, but even so those material remains really have a huge, huge impact. Um, on whoever visits the site. Um, so that's a really, I, I mean, that's the example that really sticks in my brain. Um, but for others, it really depends on what that site is and what it means to them locally. Excellent. Well, those were the questions we had. Um, so thank you, uh, Dr. Britt, for joining us and talking to us today about this 
really important topic. And uh, thank you to all our viewers for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at our next lecture, which will be Wednesday, June 2nd, when we are joined by Kimberly Smith, who will be speaking about the archaeology and the Victorian practice of picnicking in cemeteries, which I'm very intrigued by. Um, and again, we rely on the support of viewers like you, so consider supporting our outreach by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. So again, Dr. Britt, thank you. This was awesome. Thank you. Um, and everyone, let your friends know this will be um, uploaded soon to our YouTube page. So. Um, and so, thanks for, for putting up with the technical difficulties. Yes, well, you know, it is what it is. It works once and then it will never work again. Exactly. So thank you all. Okay, thank you everyone. Bye. Bye.